Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content and wish to see it continue, become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Dear listeners, a moment of your time before we get into our topic. Now, I hate to go all PBS on you here, but we desperately need more supporters to keep up our weekly episodes. Our recent hiatus was, in part, because we had to spend more time on endeavors that actually pay the bills. Yeah, we absolutely love doing this podcast, and we want to put out an episode each week, but it takes anywhere from 15 to 20 hours to make each episode a reality. That's a significant chunk of time, especially weekly. During the hiatus, we did hear from many of our loyal listeners who were concerned about whether we were going to resume. Well, we are, obviously, here we are, but we need support. If you go to AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support, you have two options to become a supporter, locals or Patreon. The support tiers are the same on both, with the lowest being just $5 a month. That's it, just $5. On both, you'll get exclusive content like our American Catholic History Conversations and our on-location videos and opportunities for video chats. But Locals is more about building a community and having greater engagement among our fans, not just with us. And if you're able to give it a higher level, we have additional perks available. So please, if you value American Catholic History, become a supporter because we like to eat food and keep the lights on, and keep producing this podcast. Learn more at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. So that said, and thank you for your support, on with the show. Yes, today we're talking about Mark Twain and his masterpiece, Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc. Now, this is an odd topic because... Well, Twain wasn't Catholic. Not only was he not Catholic, but he wasn't Christian, and he had a serious dislike of Christianity with Catholicism coming in for particular scorn. And yet, he wrote what most consider the best book about the life and impact of St. Joan of Arc. It's a beautiful book. He considered it his favorite and his best work. And given his sympathetic treatment of Joan, the reader can forget that the man who wrote it really doesn't like the Catholic Church. So let's give a thumbnail sketch of Mark Twain, of Joan of Arc, and how a cantankerous and salty American author fell in awe of, if not in love with, a 15th century French teenager. Yeah. Mark Twain was, of course, born Samuel Clemens in the town of Florida, Missouri in 1835. When he was four, the family moved to Hannibal, Missouri, and that's where he largely grew up. Hannibal is a port town on the Mississippi River, and it serves as the backdrop for his two most well-known novels, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and its sequel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. While growing up in Hannibal, young Samuel Clemens was exposed to many rough parts of life. Slavery was legal in Missouri at the time, and he witnessed the very ill treatment of black slaves. He witnessed murders, betrayals, and all manner of suffering and corruption. And since he spent plenty of his life in and around the very Catholic city of St. Louis, plenty of the corruption and unchristian behavior he witnessed was unfortunately among Catholics, and especially the Catholic hierarchy. This would have an impact on his whole life. He was raised Presbyterian, strictly Calvinist, but became very skeptical after reading the works of Thomas Paine, and he rebelled against religious orthodoxy from then on. When he was 11, his father died of pneumonia, so he had to go to work to help support the family. He got a job at a local paper as a printer's apprentice. He eventually became a typesetter and began contributing his own writings. He moved on to printing jobs in New York, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and Cincinnati, But his life's ambition was to be a pilot on the riverboats traveling up and down the mighty Mississippi. He finally got that chance, getting his license in the late 1850s when he was in his early 20s. Unfortunately for him, the Civil War came, and that seriously curtailed the free flow of riverboats on the Mississippi. Piloting on the river largely dried up. He signed up to fight for the South, but that didn't last long. He moved to Nevada and California in 1861, where he did some mining, and then went to work at a newspaper in Virginia City, Nevada. 
This actually put him in Virginia City just as the new priest, Father Patrick Minogue, began his ministry in the area. Minogue was himself a former gold miner, and he would eventually become the first bishop of Sacramento. But his time in Nevada had some pretty epic moments. So even if the two didn't meet, it's likely that Twain would have written about Father Minogue. We told Patrick Minogue's epic story in a previous episode of this podcast. Twain's writing career really began to take off in the mid-1860s, and he made lots of money. He got married and he vowed to become a better Christian, but that didn't last. He spent time in Europe in the 1870s on a tour of the Mediterranean. Due to risky investments that failed, he went bankrupt more than once. By the late 1880s, he was very pessimistic about life and viewed it more as a joke perpetrated by a cruel god. His anti-Catholicism came out in full force in his 1889 book, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. In it, the officials of the church are presented as pushers of superstition, enemies of education, and opponents of all progress. There is no redeeming quality to anyone associated with the church in that book. But one strain of Catholic beauty that stuck with him throughout his life was Joan of Arc. He had happened upon a biography of her in the early 1850s when he was a teen in Hannibal, and he couldn't believe that she was real. That memory clearly stuck with him because in the early 1890s, he spent another long stay in Europe, this time mostly in France, and there he read through everything he could find about Joan of Arc. And there was a lot to read. Great detail about her life was available in the official archives of France, including the transcripts from her trial in 1431 and her rehabilitation in 1456. So what Twain wrote was not a work of imagination. A good portion of it came directly from the sworn and reliable sources about her life. This is probably a good time to give listeners a thumbnail sketch of Joan of Arc's amazing life. She was born about 1412 in Domremy, a little town in northeast France. She was not born in, nor did she hail from, Arc. Yes, the of Arc in her name is misleading. There is no town called Arc. We call her of Arc because that is an English rendition of D apostrophe A-R-C, which seems to have been the family's last name. So her name was Jeanne d'Arc. Somewhere along the line, some English speakers turned that into Joan of Arc, but that's nonsensical in French. Anyhow, just wanted to clear that up. So Joan was a pious child and she was simple, honest, and virtuous. At 13 years old, she started hearing voices, but told no one. At first, it was St. Michael, and eventually he was joined by St. Margaret and St. Catherine. When she was 16, these voices delivered a message that would change the course of European and Christian history. Yes, they told her that she was to go to the Dauphin and lead the armies of France into battle and drive the English out of France. Now, that requires some additional background. The French and the English were about 60 years into the 100-year war. The English controlled a significant portion of modern-day France. The English kings had asserted their claim to the crown of France, and the French king at the time when Joan was born, Charles VI, was a very sick man. He died in 1422, but not until after signing a treaty with the English, which disinherited his own son and heir, Charles, from the crown of France and named the English king, Henry V, king of France. Had this treaty stood and the English kings had been able to retain the crown, it is very likely that much of France would still be part of England. Joan was told by her voices that she would lead the armies of France to victory over the English. One thing led to another, and she did gain an audience with the Dauphin. We've said that word a couple times now, so just to explain, the Dauphin is the crown prince of France. He's the rightful heir to the throne. He's the equivalent of, like, the English prince of Wales. So, since Charles VI had died... Charles VII was now the rightful king of France, but he had not yet been crowned. So even though he was effectively king after his father died, Joan still called him the Dauphin until he was actually crowned as Charles VII. So Joan, at 17 years old, wrangled an audience with the Dauphin. She convinced him that she really was sent by God by telling him something she could not have known without divine intervention and he sent her to lead a relief army to lift the siege of Orléans. After this, she led the French army from victory to victory, 
until ultimately she led the Dauphin to the cathedral at Reims, where he was crowned King Charles VII. All through this time, Joan was still hearing the voices and they directed her actions. But at many points along the way, she was stymied by the feckless and vain Charles VII. He was not a bold man during this time, and he had his advisors who had their persuasive arguments. But in just one year, Joan had completely turned the tide of the Hundred Years' War. The timid and cowering French military was winning spectacular victories. The English were on the run. Fortresses surrendered when they just saw her standard approach. And at the Battle of Pate on June 18, 1429, the English military was broken utterly. This defeat was so great that the rest of the Hundred Years' War was more or less just mop-up duty. But eventually, Charles's weakness doomed Joan's assault on Paris. Then, she was taken prisoner in May of 1430 by the forces of the Duke of Burgundy, who was allied with the English king. The Duke of Burgundy turned her over to the English, and she was placed on trial for heresy and witchcraft. The heresy charge had to do mainly with the fact that she wore men's garb and the voices that she heard. The trial was conducted by a truly odious bishop, Pierre Cauchon. Though French, he too was allied with the English. Cauchon maintained that she wore men's garb because she was a servant of the devil and that her voices were from the devil, not God. He twisted and tricked and used every tool at his disposal to get her to say something that could condemn her, but she was so naturally good and guided by her voices that she won every rhetorical fencing match. Eventually, Cochon found a way to convict her of heresy, and she was burned at the stake on May 30th, 1431. As the flames were growing around her, she begged that someone hold up a cross so she could see it as long as she was still alive. A nearby English soldier quickly fashioned one from some sticks that he lashed together, and she died with that consolation. The truly inexplicable thing about the tragic end of her life is the silence and the inactivity of King Charles VII. He could have ransomed her from the Burgundians before they turned her over to the English. He could have sent an army to rescue her. He did nothing. He didn't even protest her ill treatment. The man who owed his crown and his kingdom to Joan of Arc let Cauchon and the English put her to death as a heretic. Her death was seen as a calamity in France. Even while alive, she'd become a figure of honor and awe. Her cult became established early, and in France, at least, she was revered from early after her death. Though naturally, English-speaking lands didn't quite have the same sense of her for many years. Her rehabilitation happened 25 years later when the Pope ordered a re-examination of the case against her and the proceedings of the trial. The rehabilitation was largely motivated by King Charles VII. He had retaken nearly all of France by this point, but the English were charging that he only had his crown because of a witch who had been burned for heresy. So he was eager to have the trial re-examined and the conviction overturned. So the Pope convened an examination and, rightly, it was all found to have been a sham. Joan was posthumously declared innocent of the charges in 1456. But her cause for canonization took longer. She was beatified in 1909, the year before Mark Twain's death, and she was canonized in 1920. That is a very, very brief version of her story. What Twain discovered about her was just how honest, simple, straightforward, and pure she was, even throughout the war. She didn't even carry a sharpened sword for fear of harming someone. She wept over the loss of life. She led from the front. She talked with humility, yet passion to the king. She positively viewed him as the sovereign lord of France and humbled herself in his presence. Though in all honesty, it should have been the other way around. Oh, definitely. She died without denying anything that was true, without becoming angry or bitter, and without giving in to their tricks. As Twain said it, it took 6,000 years to produce her. Her like will not be seen in the earth again in 50,000, such is my opinion. He also said of her, she is easily and by far the most extraordinary person the human race has ever produced. And the book he wrote about her shows this reverence on nearly every page. Of writing the book, Twain said it took 12 years of preparation and two years of writing. The manuscript was completed in 1895, but he did something odd with it. Though he regarded it as his best work, and though he enjoyed writing this book more than any other of his books, he published it first in a series of articles in Harper's Weekly, and he published them under a pseudonym. 
It's almost as though he didn't want his own name to get in the way. He loved and respected the story and the woman it was about too greatly to associate it with himself and his own reputation. Yeah, and indeed, when the public found out that he was the author, there was confusion. A lot of people just didn't believe it. The book was a significant departure for him. It lacked the typical sardonic humor, biting social commentary, and mischievous adventures of his previous beloved works. And of course, this was the man who had published Connecticut Yankee just seven years earlier. How could he write such a Catholic book? Well, I haven't thought about that. Here's Twain. His two most well-known books were about mischievous adolescents going on adventure, getting into trouble, and back out again. They encounter all kinds of people, a lot of them not very pleasant. In his own life, Twain experienced and observed a lot of ugliness and corruption. In Joan of Arc, he found something pure that the world did not and could not corrupt. He found something beautiful in a world that he had come to believe had nothing but ugliness. Yeah, if you think about it, even in Joan of Arc, the institutional church doesn't really come out looking that great. Sure, he talks about how the Pope rehabilitated Joan in 1456, but that's basically in the epilogue. The hierarchy that we meet really is only the extremely terrible Bishop Cochon, the forked-tongued prosecutor. Even the Catholic French king and his Catholic nobles do not come across so well. So while it's not rank anti-Catholicism like in the Connecticut Yankee, the view of the institutional church, well, it just isn't great. The great savior of the book, of course, is Joan, and she reverences all those who hold an office of dignity. She reverences the king. She respects the bishop, even while decrying his tactics. She reveres her parish priest back in Domremy. She is just a pure soul who shows what a Catholic can be. And he drives that idea home in a long passage. I'll just read a little bit of it. Quote, When we reflect that her century was the brutalist, the wickedest, the rottenest in history since the darkest ages, we are lost in wonder at the miracle of such a product from such soil. The contrast between her and her century is the contrast between night and day. She was truthful when lying was the common speech of men. She was a keeper of promises when the keeping of a promise was expected of no one. She was modest and fine and delicate when to be loud and coarse might be said to be universal. She was full of pity when a merciless cruelty was the rule. She was steadfast when stability was unknown and honorable in an age which had forgotten what honor was. It's almost like Twain is saying, here's the ideal. Why can't more of those Christians... Well, why can't more people in general be like that? That's a great question. Twain said something else about writing this book that is important. Very late in his life, he said, I like Joan of Arc best of all my books, and it is the best. I know it perfectly well. And besides, it furnished me seven times the pleasure afforded me by any of the others. Twelve years of preparation and two years of writing. The others needed no preparation and got none. Twain was a gifted storyteller, and most of his stories just sort of came out of his own experiences. He didn't have to do research or do deep studies. He just wrote what he already knew, and what he knew comes through in those. But this was different. This one was done not to make a buck, but out of passion. This book was written because he genuinely loved the topic and thought this book needed to exist and that people should read it. In fact, one admirer of Twain related a story about meeting Twain as a boy. When he was young, he lived nearby Twain's house in Reading, Connecticut. One day he saw Twain by himself out in public and went over to him. He had long wanted to have a private moment with Twain to tell him just how much he loved Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. When Twain heard his admiring words, he reacted strangely. Poking a finger at the boy, Twain said, You shouldn't read those books about bad boys. Now listen to what an old man tells you. My best book is my Recollections of Joan of Arc. You are too young to understand and enjoy it now, but read it when you are older. Remember then what I tell you now. Joan of Arc is my very best book. And that's that. Twain died in 1910, one year after Joan of Arc was declared blessed. During his lifetime, the book was fairly well received, even if his most loyal fans never quite knew what to do with it. Critics in the 20th century were not as kind. The book is often left out of lists of Twain's works, and it is usually panned when it is reviewed. Susan Harris, a professor who was billed as an expert on Twain, wrote, By the time Twain is writing re recollections, he's not a believer. He is an anti-Catholic. 
and he doesn't like the French. So he writes a book about a French Catholic martyr. Ostensibly, it doesn't make a lot of sense. She's exactly right. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But it can make perfect sense if we consider that Twain saw in Joan of Arc, the maid of Orléans, a redeeming presence, and he found that he could finally write a book that mattered. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter. Get information about how to do that and the perks of becoming a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Joan of Arc and Mark Twain, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History. On Instagram at ACH underscore podcast. Or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. <laughs>